My name is Dr. Ade Adeshi, and I work as an anesthesiologist out of Chicago and have been for about 10 years. I've seen all sorts of things, but the one thing that I've noticed that's prevalent and devastating is cardiovascular disease. Now, the two things that I focus on when I want to put someone to sleep for surgery is one, the condition of their lungs, because I take control of their breathing of my patients when they're asleep, and then two, I focus on the heart. Now, anesthesia is a cardiac depressant, so I need to have their heart in tip-top condition before I can administer anesthesia. There are ways to optimize the heart prior to surgery, but I'm literally at the mercy of the heart. There is a lot of cardiac disease out there, ranging from hypertension all the way to heart failure, and this presents a challenge in my field. I see more people in the hospital with hypertension and diabetes than without. Now, the number one killer of Americans today is cardiovascular disease. It can present as a quick death or a slow and painful death. Now, cardiovascular disease starts with hypertension, which is a persistent and chronic high blood pressure. And if you think that blood pressure is not a big deal and think that, oh, I'll just take my blood pressure medications and I'll be all right. Well, think again, about 33% of the adult US population has high blood pressure. That's 80 million people. Now, of those that are taking their blood pressure medication, half don't even have their blood pressure under control. And so let me give some statistics, just to put some perspective into this. About 69% of people who have a, their first heart attack, 77% of people who have their first stroke, and 74% of people who have congestive heart failure have a blood pressure over 140 systolic, over 90 diastolic. Now your doctor will even tell you that blood pressure is over 140 over 90 is hypertension. Having high blood pressure over this number is when you start to see arterial damage. There are even some sources that say that blood pressure is over 120 over 80, which is pre-hypertension, is when you start to see arterial damage. The population with the highest rates of high blood pressure in the world are African Americans. They are particularly prone to this disease. Now, although there has been advancements in science and medicine, hypertension is projected to increase about 8% between 2013 and 2030, according to the American Heart Association. I would be hard pressed to find a patient in a hospital without high blood pressure or diabetes. And the age of patients with high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease is actually decreasing into the 20s. That's how prevalent high blood pressure really is. So you might be thinking, so what? What if my blood pressure is really high? What's it gonna do? Well, you know how marijuana is the gateway drug to worse drugs like heroin and cocaine. Well, hypertension is a gateway disease to worse diseases and conditions like stroke, heart attack, peripheral artery disease, consists of heart failure, shortness of breath, kidney failure, dialysis four hours a day, three times a week, leg amputations, blindness, and the list goes on and on and on. So if you or someone that you know that has high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease, you've come to the right place because I'm gonna show you not only how to prevent cardiovascular disease, but even how to reverse it. So what I want you to do is continue watching this video because following is a free presentation on how cardiovascular disease actually develops so you can understand how to stop it in its tracks and what tools you need to prevent it for good. So continue to watch this video and start your journey to renewed health and I'll meet you there. During this session, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about every aspect of cardiovascular disease, how it starts, how it progresses, and how it ends. So I'm not only gonna talk about the heart, but we're also gonna talk about the kidneys, the brain, arteries, veins, and other organs. We're gonna focus more on vascular disease because blood vessels permeate every part of our body, every cell, every tissue. So if you have diseased vessels going to, the, going to organs, they're gonna affect those organs. So let's go ahead and move on with the presentation. Now this is the vascular system. Now the body has many systems. You have the respiratory system, lymphatic system, the immune system. But the vascular system is really important because they, are, they bring basically oxygen and nutrients and also take away waste. It's basically the foundation of everything that makes the body live and thrive. Um, so the thing about the, the blood vessels carry the life force that allows us to function. Blood vessels need constant flow. Flow is what brings life. Flow brings in the new and also takes out the old. Um, it's just kind of like a flowing river or a flowing ocean current with constant turnover. Um, basically, when flow stops, what you have is a stagnant, festering pond. Now, stoppage of flow in the body brings death and disease. Um, 
best way I can describe it is kind of like when you're in a room with no ventilation and you're breathing in the same air over and over and over again, just like that stale air. So you're basically bringing out carbon dioxide and you're bringing it back in. What you need is you need to open the windows. You need to turn on the ventilation to kind of basically bring fresh air in and circulate that air. You need that constant flow. You need that constant circulation. Now, this is so basically the vascular system is hydraulically based. It's uh, based on pressure and it works with a central pump and that's the brain. Now, the, the heart's job is to pump enough blood to each organ and ultimately every cell in the body. Um, it pumps enough pressure and enough, with enough force and blood is basically circulated throughout the whole entire blood system and is returned back into the heart only, be, only to be pumped right back out again. So what dictates how hard and how fast the heart pumps are the organs. Now the organs may be, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have the kidneys, you have the liver, depending on how hard they work. Um, they have to work hard. They produce a lot of waste products and they use a lot of energy. And that's going to make the heart pump, uh, basically pump faster, pump stronger. Um, uh, say, for example, you're exercising, you're doing like an anaerobic exercise like you're sprinting or you're doing like uh heavy lifting okay you're going to build up some lactic acid and in order for that lactic acid to basically uh, flow out you need constant flow you need that you need the heart to pump fast you need that heart to pump hard to basically bring in nutrients and oxygen and take out the lactic acid that's basically how the heart works got to remove those uh those waste products now the heart pumps blood to the brain, the kidneys, the liver, the muscles, the intestines, but most importantly, it pumps blood to itself. The heart starts to beat in the womb at 22 weeks after conception and only stops during death and sometimes even after death. And the heart will beat over 3 billion times in a lifetime, pumping blood in the amount of 1 million barrels. Now, just imagine walking for decades until you die, or reading a book, or trying to figure out a complicated math problem constantly until you die. That's just, just imagine that kind of like fantastic feat. That's essentially what the heart does. It continues to pump until you die, nonstop. It doesn't take any coffee breaks, it doesn't take a nap, because it can't. Because if the heart stops pumping, you cease to exist. Now, this is an image that shows the percentage of all total blood flow that goes out to each organ. Now, on average, the heart's going to pump about five liters of blood within a minute. Okay, now out of that five liters, you know, it's all going to be divvied up into each organ. So, for example, 3% of that five liters is going to go to the heart. All right. Now, doesn't really, the heart doesn't really need that much blood, but what it really needs is oxygen. And I'm going to talk about that momentarily. 14% actually goes to the brain. And then you have 22% of the blood that goes to the kidneys. Okay, that's a lot of blood. And the highest portion of the blood goes to the liver, receiving about 27% of the total blood flow. Now, the reason why the liver and the kidneys get so much blood is because these are filtering organs. They basically screen the, screen the blood for waste products or for toxins and kind of like disable the toxins to be become harmless to the body. It's almost like putting a Brita filter on the faucet where it kind of removes all the all the toxins and all the waste products so you have clean, pristine water. Now let's talk about oxygen extraction. Okay, now you're getting all this flow going to all the organs, but the important thing is being able to extract oxygen from the blood. Now when blood is coming from the heart, you're going to have 100% uh, all the hemoglobin is going to be 100% saturated. It's going to be full. It's like having a full gas tank, okay? Now, each of the organs, the heart, the brain, and the liver, have different abilities, different skill sets of how much oxygen that, how much oxygen they can actually extract from the blood, okay? Some of these organs extract more. Some of these organs extract less. And it all depends on how dependent they are on oxygen. Let's take the heart, for example. The heart typically extracts 60% of oxygen. Okay, and that's a lot, all right, compared to all the organs. The brain extracts 33% of oxygen, all right, okay, doesn't seem that much, but it is a lot compared to all the other organs. And then the liver extracts 16.7% of oxygen, and the kidneys 
extract 7.5% of oxygen. Now remember that the liver and the kidneys are, you know, they get a lot of blood flow. They're, they're basically filtering organs, but you see they don't need that much oxygen. All right. So just kind of give you guys a uh, perspective. Now the brain starts to have damage um, after three to five minutes without oxygen leading to a stroke. Now, during organ transplantation, um, certain organs can survive outside the body under ice for various amounts of time, depending on how reliant they are on oxygen. So let's take the example of the heart and the lungs that are most reliant under most reliant on oxygen. So under ice, they can survive about six, about six hours outside the body. The liver and the pancreas can survive about 24 hours. Uh, the kidneys survive about 72 hours, and the bone is one of the less reliant organs on oxygen, and they can survive about five years outside the body. Okay. So the best, so the best analogy I can give to show you how, um, how uh, you know, pressure and flow and how it works in the body is give you an analogy of uh, how we receive water into our homes. Okay, now if you live in a suburb or in a small town, you may have seen one of these structures. This is basically a water tower. A water tower carries water, obviously. Um, now, how it works is you have water electrically pumped into these tall water towers. And basically, it uses the force of gravity to force water down to basically spread into, into every home in the area. Now, if you're driving in the suburbs, you might have seen one of these where it has like the village name on there. Um, and that's basically how it works. So just to give you a little bit more information on this. So here's the water tower, okay? And what it does is going to use the force of gravity to push pressure, all right, into each of these homes, okay? Now, in order to get a normal amount of uh, water pressure, you want to be below the level of the water tower, okay? So you don't want to be up here. You don't want to be over here. You want to be below the level of the water. Like I said, it's using gravity, all right? Now, if you had a house that's up here, you'll probably have all the water flow out of here into the water tower. You want to be below the level of the water tower. So for example, these homes down here, they're going to get adequate amount of water pressure coming through their faucets and shower heads. Okay? Um, because they're below the level of the water tower. Now these homes up here might have a little issue, okay? Like this house over here, even though it's, it's, it's right below the uh, level of the water tower, you might have kind of like a weak pressure. Uh, might need an auxiliary pump to kind of help pump the, to get a normal amount of pressure coming through. This house up here, it's probably going to barely get any water pressure. So like I said again, you need a water pump, like an auxiliary pump to get enough pressure through. Um, now, typically you're not going to see these, you're not going to see any buildings in the suburbs with these water towers because you, if you have like a 20-story building, typically 20-story buildings are going to be like taller than this water tower and it's going to be difficult for, for basically the actually supply enough pressure to get to the top of the building okay so like for, for example these guys these units down here might get enough water okay they might be fine once you start getting higher these guys are going to get very low water pressure okay if any at all and then these guys at the top are not going to get any water pressure all right so you're not going to see a lot of buildings in these small villages you're typically going to see them in urban centers and cities Right. So um, you would have to construct a water tower as big as the Seattle Space Needle. All right. And even with that, it's not going to be high enough to supply water to all the buildings and surrounding areas. OK, so what do they do in this, in this in these situations? So instead of having a water tower in a city, you're going to have a central pumping station. Now, you know, uh, in reality, there's actually several pumping stations all over the city but for the sake of simplicity let's just look at it as one central pumping station all right so what the pumping station is going to do it's going to basically electronically pump water all right it's going to pump water with enough force and enough pressure to basically reach all these houses okay and that's important just imagine you got the just imagine these were this was the heart and this was the you know these were organs like the kidney brain, the liver, um, you know, the intestines, okay? It needs to pump pressure throughout all the, and, and it has to be high enough. Now, when you're pumping pressure for that, you know, when you're uh, pumping water that 
high of a pressure, um, you don't want water to be shooting out of your faucet or your or your uh, shower head like a like a like a basically a fire hose. So before it gets to each house, each house has basically a, like a, a regulator. It stops, steps down the pressure. So it go. So basically, it goes in with an adequate amount, adequate amount of pressure where it's not causing any like a like a like a jet of water coming out at you. All right. Now, for example. Okay, these are so you're getting like uh, water from the main, all right, and, and here so you can water say it's about maybe sixty side pressure, all right. Now you want to be able to regulate that pressure, okay? You want to be able to regulate that pressure so it stops down so it comes out at to forty side. And important, and it's really important so so that the water does not shoot out like a fire hose, all right. And that's how basically that's how basically the uh, the body works. We also have these regulators, which I'll talk about. Okay. Now, another another analogy I like to talk about is also tap water is not pristine as it contains minerals like lead, arsenic, calcium additives like chloride and fluoride. All these minerals, inorganic minerals, they create a lot of deposits against the walls. You get all this lime and and all this uh, collection going on. It can cause plum, plumbing pro problems. You know, over time, you can get a lot of uh, a lot of gunk stuck in there and you have to get the plumber to kind of like clear out the uh, clear out the pipes this is almost analogous to plaque being deposited against the walls that's why it's always important to to do what you need to do to make sure to keep your veins and arteries clean now the human body works in a similar way as a uh, as this water pump okay water pumping stations the heart you know arteries and pipes um, but it's much more dynamic. Now, the heart is the central pump. It has to generate enough pressure to pump uh, to the head, to the feet. Blood is all pumped to each individual organ. So pressures need to be regulated or stepped down before you reach each organ, like the brain and the eyes, to avoid pressure-induced damage. So just like the pressure regulators we were just talking about, when water gets pumped to the home, we also have those pressure regulators. Now, over here... Are the arterioles these are our pressure regulators so basically you have uh, oxygenated blood coming from the heart okay this is the biggest artery in the, in the uh, body the aorta and it goes to these medium-sized arteries and then goes to these smaller size arteries which are the arterioles and they regulate pressure they can they can dilate and they can constrict okay and these and depending on how um, each organ is going to depend on how much they constrict because each organ has their uh, their uh, set pressure, their optimal pressure where they like to receive blood. Because you can actually get pressure-related damage. You can get pressure-related damage to the kidneys, uh, pressure-related damage to the eyes. So you want to be able to regulate that pressure. Now, when you lose that regulation, then you can start getting seeing damage to the kidneys, the eyes, and other organs. So it's important for these to be working adequately. All right? Now these um now these uh no so you're gonna have higher pressure coming through here, all right? And then arterials are gonna regulate these pressures, and then they're gonna come out at a lower pressure at the capillaries. Now the capillaries are very small, very small um vessels. They're like the size, they're like the size and width of an actual cell. And this is where all the foundation takes place. This is where nutrients uh are nutrients are received. Wastes are disposed of. This is where oxygen is uh, taken up and carbon, carbon dioxide is exposed of. So this is this is basically when we go through this journey. This is our destination, and this is basically how we receive our nutrition, our energy, however you want to call it. Okay, each cell is gonna each cell is gonna get what they need. Each t all the tissues are gonna get what they need. Now, once everything is taken up, all right, and all the oxygen is taken up. You're gonna have deoxygenated blood going through here, through the through the venules. Venules are basically small veins, okay, and they all kind of meet up and go into bigger veins, okay. And when you have, you don't want to have blockage in here, okay. So basically, if you have like a blood clot, you know, it's called a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. When you have a, when you have an obstruction, it causes a backup, and then that's why you might have like swelling in your legs, okay. Uh, those blood clots can cause issues like that. So the point, so basically, 
they're all going to, so basically all this deoxygenated blood is going to come back through here and it's going to reach the right side of the heart. Okay. And, it, and basically it's going to get oxygenated again through the lungs and you're going to start this whole process all over again. So that's basically the nitty gritty of it. So basically it's, it's almost like, just like I said, just like the, the housing analogies, like you got the clean water, you got the clean water coming in through the faucets and then the dirty water getting leads through the sewer pipes. All right. So now that we've covered the basics, um, now it's time to get to the good stuff. Okay. We're going to talk about what causes high blood pressure. Specifically, what causes hypertension, which is basically persistent high blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure, it's, it's normal to have um, blood pressure temporarily during elevated times of stress. Uh, because, and this is usually due to the rush of adrenaline. And there's a couple of reasons why we have a rush of adrenaline. It become due to fear. It could be due to um, exercise. It could be due to pain, even excitement. Okay. But high blood pressure, when you have um, high, a person, high, persistent high blood pressure, that's a symptom, all right? And that persistent high blood pressure it becomes hypertension, and hypertension is what is the disease. So there are many reasons why you can have high blood pressure. I mean, there's, there's countless, many, uh, countless reasons uh, why somebody might have high blood pressure. But whatever it is, they typically are going to affect these five parameters, okay? These, when, you, when you change any of these five parameters, it's going to cause your blood pressure to, to elevate, all right? The strength of the, you can have, you know, increased strength of the heart contraction, okay? Increased vascular volume, all right? Meaning more, you know, the more fluid in, in, the, in the cells, or in the, in the blood vessels, uh, decreased vascular elasticity, your the ability for the, the veins to the arteries to uh, to expand, and then decreased vascular diameter. Basically, the lumen, you know, how much space you have in the lumen and viscosity. Okay, so we're going to talk about each one of these um, each one of these mechanisms. So the strength of the contraction. Now, what people need to realize is, you know, hypertension is the gateway disease to more terrible and debilitating diseases. All right. So, so this is, you have two hearts over here, okay? On the left, you have a normal beating heart, normal rhythm, and normal contraction, producing a normal blood pressure of 120 over 70. Now, that's typically normal. Now, on this side, all right, you have a fast beating heart, okay? You can kind of see that this, this, this is kind of simulating a, an adrenaline infused heart okay it's being fast it's being hard you see it's contracting to the point where it's it's decreasing its volume pushing all that all that blood out and it's creating the blood pressure of 160 over 95 okay so this is what happens when you have a a heart that's beating hard and beating fast just to give you an idea picture it in your head okay um another thing that can cause a uh, increased blood pressure is the increased vascular volume, okay? So let's picture this. Picture a balloon and water being put into the balloon, all right? And you have, an, and you have a little bit of water. That, so you have a little bit of water being put into the balloon and it's barely changing the pressure. All right, when you, continue, when you basically continue to fill the balloon, it starts to expand and increases the pressure a little bit. But since the balloon has a, innate ability to basically compensate for that increased volume, you're not going to have such a huge uh, increase in pressure. Right? See? So basically you have a low, like a slow increase in pressure. All right. Now you go ahead and you're putting more water in the balloon. The balloon continues to expand. It still has enough elasticity to compensate for that, uh, for that volume. But you can see like, you know, the pressure is starting to go up, but not so much. Now the uh, balloon is starting to maximally, it's, it's starting to get to its maximum right now. You see this, sh this shot up in the pressure, okay? So pressure shooting up, it's about to, re it's about to reach its uh, maximum amount of volume, okay? Um, now over here, you basically reached your max. This is, this is the max amount of volume that you've, 
like basically right here, the pressure is basically shooting up. The volume continues to come. Now, when you put more water in here, what's going to happen? It's going to burst. Now, this kind of this kind of uh, gives you an idea of of um, this is what happens in the head. Like the, the balloon burst, the same thing happens when blood vessels burst in the head, leading to a stroke. When you have um, you know, a very high blood pressure, and when the blood, say you remember like the arterioles leading to the to the brain, if those things are not working right, or the blood pressure is so high that you kind of bypass those arterioles, you can, lead, you can have a stroke in this situation. So it's important to have those things just to kind of keep that in mind. Same thing with an aneurysm bursting in the chest or abdomen, which can be devastating. So let's take uh, so let's take a a balloon for example with a constant uh, amount of volume. All right, so you have a constant amount of volume. You have basically a pressure about sixty five millimeters of mercury. Now, when you squeeze the balloon, this simulates a heart contraction. Okay, so basically before it was sixty five. When you squeeze it, the pressure in there is 120, okay? So this, so, so the bottom number down here is going to be your diastolic. The top number over here is going to be your systolic. And basically, you have your diastolic, systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic, systolic. This is how the heart works, all right? So this number is always going to be higher than this bottom number right here. And this simulates heart contractions. There you go. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is decreased vascular elasticity. And I'm talking about decreased um, vascular elasticity, um, just like the balloon example. That balloon has an innate elasticity. It can expand as compared to, like, say, like a, a plastic bottle. It can't expand. It has a fixed volume. But the balloon is able to expand. So our blood vessels are the same way. It can expand, it can contract, depending on how much fluid is in our blood vessels. Now, take for example, let's just say, okay, so this black line, let's say that this black line represents all the space in your vascular system, all the space within the vessels. We're not talking about the blood, we're just talking about the space in the blood vessels of the whole body. This is the representation of that. Now, uh, now, the, the red, that's the blood, okay? This is the how much blood is in those blood vessels, all right? So, since the blood vessels are elastic and can stretch, that space is not constant, but it's always changing. So, due to elasticity, okay? So, say, for example, the amount of blood volume increases, you know, either, either due to, you know, you're drinking more or whatever the case may be, your, since... Since your uh, vessels are va are elastic, they can compensate and they can stretch out to increase the to basically decrease the pressure to six you know to sixty five, and then you're normal again. Okay, that's normal. All right. Now, say for example, you you have a low blood volume, either due to dehydration or you got into an accident and you're losing blood. Okay, so the uh so the basically the blood vessels are going to react and they're going to constrict all right to bring the pr pressure back to normal because you need an optimal amount of pressure to infuse all of your organs okay if your blood pressure is too if your blood pressure is too high you don't want to cause pressure related damage if your blood pressure is too low you don't want to cause low circulation to those organs and that can cause damage too it has to be an optimal optimal amount of pressure Okay. Now, say for example, for whatever reason you can't compensate. Either your pressure is really too high for the normal vessels to to take care of it, or the pressure is too low where the where the blood vessels cannot compensate for that, or you have some kind of disease that you lose that elasticity. You know, diseases like per, like atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. These are these are hardening of the arteries. Okay, where you lose that elasticity. If you can't change the elasticity, you you lose that that um that ability to be, to compensate for high volumes and to reduce the pressure. So, for example, you have that increase in volume. All right, increase in blood volume. 
but your but your vessels are unable to stretch enough out enough to compensate for that volume well you're gonna have a constantly elevated blood pressure over here all right and it's gonna be and it's gonna and it's gonna stay that way this is this is typically what happens with um kidney patients all right and that's why they have to get dialysis about three times a week okay and it's really difficult for um blood pressure to or uh, blood pressure medication to treat this kind of blood pressure all right you need to release that volume now next thing that we want to talk about is decreased vascular diameter um basically what decreased vascular diameter is is basically diameter of your vessels which like i said before you need flow to in order to thrive you want to make sure that your vessels are open you don't want any blockages any obstruction to that flow so basically, that's another thing that will increase hypertension. Now, as you can see here, you see diff different levels of blockage in the blood vessels, all right? So finally, inflamed blood vessels tend to develop plaque, all right? And they can cause a decrease in the vascular lumen globally and ultimately cause an obstruction. And this is known as atherosclerosis. And when it gets really bad and it starts affecting organs and whatnot, you have peripheral vascular disease, all right? And as you can see here, plaque continues to grow. Now, how it starts is you have high blood pressure. It presses against the, it presses against the arteries. It causes sheer stress, micro tears. Micro tears cause inflammation. And then you have recruitment of platelets, recruitment of, of calcium to patch up that uh, tear. And that causes the scar. All right, and the scar is basically the plaque. And you see the plaque continues to grow, all right? Eventually, when it, you can see here that it takes up half the space in the lumen. And then you're talking about really bad obstruction in this situation, okay? You're still getting some blood flow, but it's compromised blood flow. And basically, when you have complete blockage, all right, that's when you have an emergency. I mean, this can happen with when we get a cold leg in an OR when there's no blood flow going through. Okay, that's the medical emergency. Um, they have to actually, there's like a clot. This is a, a rupture of the plaque and it can cause like acute inflammation, development of a clot, and obstruct an acute obstruction of blood flow. That's when you have to go to the emergency room, um, get that clot out. Otherwise, you're going to lose the leg. So that's an emergency. So this is something that you need to be aware of, atherosclerosis, vascular disease. And this, is de this develops over years and years um, and doesn't happen overnight. So just kind of, kind of give you an idea how peripheral vascular disease works and how atherosclerosis works. Basically, it affects the smaller vessels first, okay? It affects the larger vessels, but more the smaller vessels. So while blood pressure increases essentially due to less vascular space um, from blocked and narrowed arteries, blood pressure and blood flow decreases peripherally, basically in the legs and basically in the arms. So basically you're losing blood flow in this area, you're losing blood flow gradually in, in these areas, okay, because these are smaller arteries. So basically your entire blood volume is restricted centrally. Okay, you're getting some blood flow and some blood pressure in this uh, in these um, arteries and whatnot, but not as much. Okay, so basically you're going to have low blood pressure in your arms and in your legs, and you're going to have a higher blood pressure centrally, and that's going to cause a centrally high blood pressure, which is what you don't want. Okay, and also, uh, and also when you have low when you have obstructions in the in these arteries, you have a high propensity to to develop like a clot and like I said you can have a the clot that basically lodges in an already narrowed space and you can basically lose a limb that way all right so that's the same thing how a heart attack works that's the same thing how a stroke works okay so just something to keep in mind so let's talk about circulation now when you have decreased circulation going to certain organs they have different names depending on what organs that they lead to now, when you have poor circulation to the legs, that ends up, you end up having pain first, okay? That's another uh, name for that is claudication, all right? Basically, you're having pain from low blood flow to the feet. If you, base, if you step on a nail or you stub your toe and it starts bleeding, you can develop a wound, and that wound is not going to heal because you're not getting any nutrients, you're not getting any oxygen into that area. So that wound is not going to heal. 
is going to get infected. And in order not to get a generalized sepsis, it can result in amputation. Low blood flow to, low blood flow to the brain can end up with um, brain fog. You can, end, you can end up with dementia when it's carried out over time. And when you have an acute low blood flow to the brain, when you have like a stroke or a sudden um, burst, a sudden burst in, in, the, in, the, in the artery, you end up with a stroke. Low blood flow to the heart. When you have a chronic low blood flow to the heart, another name for that is um, ischemic cardiomyopathy. Okay, so it's a, it's a it's a form of heart failure. Okay, your heart starts to expand. Um, when you when you have a acute low blood flow, you end up having chest pain. Uh, the name of chest pain is angina, and that, and that leads to a heart attack. Low blood flow to the kidneys. You end up with kidney failure, end up on dialysis, and have to end up on the waiting list for a transplant. Low blood flow to intestine, you end up with gangrenous bowel. Okay, now anytime you have a gangrenous bowel, there's a high risk of perforation. When you perforate the bowel, all the fecal contents basically ooze out of that perforation, out of that hole, into the abdominal cavity, and that's bad news. Uh, you end up with sepsis, and survival is not good. Low blood flow to the genitals, that's, a, you know, that's erectile dysfunction. Uh, low blood flow to the eyes leads to blindness. So all these things that you kind of got to be aware of. You know, low blood flow, when we say poor circulation, you're affecting all the end organs and causes end organ damage. Next thing we want to talk about is viscosity. Now, viscosity is something that is most is basically, for the most part, overlooked by medicine. But it's actually a big part, uh, plays a big part on flow. Okay, a uh, blood viscosity is the thickness and the stickiness of the blood. It's the direct measure of the ability of the blood to flow through the vessels. Now, this these are different types of viscous fluids. Okay, and you can kind of see the difference just from looking at them. Like over here, you can have uh, water. All right, this is like the viscosity of water. Over here is like an oily viscous fluid, and over here is the thickness of like Vaseline. Now, just try try to imagine trying to the heart trying to push Vaseline through your blood vessels. The heart would explode. I mean, there's just no way that it can do that. And that basically depends on the stickiness, the thickness of the blood, okay? Because the higher the viscosity, the more the friction and the more restriction of blood flow, the higher the blood pressure and the more stress it is on the heart. So viscosity of the blood goes up when there are too many blood cells, more than usual, and when the space between the blood cells are decreased or non-existent. So in this image, um, you can see that there's, you can see on the image on the right that there's a stacking of red blood cells on this side, okay, with no personal space in between them. They're kind of stacked like a, like, uh, like a poker chips at the casino, all right? Now, people refer to this as thick blood. Blood like this has propensity to clot and cause strokes, all right? So this is what you don't want. All right. They need to, they need to be able to have space to breathe. OK, this, their surface area is compromised. And that's something that you want to be able to prevent and kind of spread those apart. Now, you can see the difference on this side. All right. This is, what you, this is thinner blood. OK, you see, can see how each of these blood cells have their own zip or their own area code. They have space to breathe. They're not on top of each other, but they're kind of spread apart. They have more surface area to take in nutrients and dispel waste. That's what you want, ideally, all right? You want to be able to assimilate nutrients. So, you know, this whole time we've been talking about vascular disease. And, you know, vascular disease has different faces, okay? And it causes so many situations, all right? Now, some of these, some of these, uh, all these diseases basically describe poor blood flow to areas, to certain areas or locations in the body. Like atherosclerosis is just global low blood flow everywhere. It's basically development of plaque, basically in your in your uh, arteries of the heart, uh, big vessels going to the to, to kidneys, the brain, pretty much everywhere. That's atherosclerosis, and when it gets really bad. Uh, to the point where you're having either strokes or basically poor wound healing or an organ failure, that's when it be, that's peripheral vascular disease. Peripheral vascular disease is when you start chopping limbs off or taking out uh, organs. Um, arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. Okay, like we told, like we were talking about before with the balloon, it has that elasticity. It can accommodate for increased volume 
arterial sclerosis can't do that because the arteries are hard. It's almost like you're pouring water into a plastic glass instead of a balloon. If you get what I mean? Angina is basically chest pain. Okay, that's some that's typically the warning signs you get before a heart attack. Um, coronary artery disease is basically plaque. Arthrosclerosis of the coronary arteries leading to the heart. Arthrosclerosis is basically plaque in the uh, coronary arteries. Left ventricular hypertrophy is basically a muscle-bound heart. Okay, a muscle-bound heart trying to push blood against high blood pressure. All right, this is this is this is a stage that you go through before you get to um, before you get to uh, congestive heart failure. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, basically you get a you get a large heart because you're getting low blood flow to the heart. Congestive heart failure, aortic aneurysm is basically um, like a weakening of the wall. Okay, and this has to do with um, nutrients. This has to do with uh, wall damage, inflammation. And you get a ballooning of the weakening of the wall, and if you have a high blood pressure, it worsens that and has a high propensity to rupture, and that can be devastating. Another thing that can be devastating is aortic dissection. When you have a splitting of the actual muscle, the, uh, the muscular uh, wall of the actual artery. This is what John Ritter died from, from Three's Company. Okay, and that can be devastating also. Um, cerebrovascular disease, low blood flow to the brain. You can get vascular dementia, stroke, chronic kidney disease. Uh, like we said before, leads to uh, end-stage renal failure and hemodialysis and kidney transplant. Audication, which is leg pain, you get foot ulcers and limb, multiple limb amputations, erectile dysfunction. Uh, we talked about bowel ischemia. We talked about when you end up with a bowel resection, and hopefully you can survive if it didn't rupture. Um, retinovascular disease is basically low blood flow or an acute clot in the arteries leading to the eye, which can lead to blindness. Okay, uh, this is uh, diabetics are get. You know, Diabetics are prone to that kind of thing. Deep vein, thrombo deep vein thrombosis is a blood clot in the legs. Um, and you want to be careful because when you have blood clot in the legs, blood starts to pool and back up. Um, you get a swelling and pain in that calf. And the important thing about this that doctors are weary about is that you can have a piece of a clot that can break off and go into the lung. And when it goes to the lung, it could be something that you might not notice, or the clot could be so big that it can end up in sudden death. So this is something that um, they'll put you on a blood thinner on like Coumadin. Um, varicose veins is also a vascular issue where you have dysfunctional valves in the, in the veins. And that and you can have, uh, you can have uh, pooling of uh, blood in the legs and whatnot. And it's also unsightly. It's an aesthetic thing, but also it can, it can basically affect your health. So, like I said, all these diseases, it all starts from one place, high blood pressure. And that's why I say high blood pressure is the gateway to cardiovascular disease. So if you can treat your high blood pressure, you can kind of avoid all of this. Now that you have an idea of the origin and mechanism of cardiac disease, now it's time to show you how to reverse it and return your cardiovascular system back to what it was as a teenager. We've talked about how cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in America. If you can eliminate cardiovascular disease as a factor, just imagine how many years you can add on to your life, as well as the improved quality of life. No medications, decreased healthcare costs, more energy and vitality, basically living life to its fullest. I've prepared a set of videos, comprehensive videos, called the Vascular Cleanse video series that walks you through just how to reverse hypertension and cardiovascular disease, especially if you're prone to it because of a strong family history. Find out what simple things that you can do to start reversing the biological age of your cardiovascular system. Find out what most people and most doctors don't know when it comes to turning back the clock on your heart and your arteries. We delve deep into the genetics and instruct how to tweak the specific biochemistry towards optimal health. Some things are actually really simple and all it takes is just knowing what tweaks need to be made. Albert Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So obviously some things have to change, and I'll show you how to do that through this video series. It's a small investment towards yourself for a lifetime of good health and decreased medical expenses. So go ahead and click the link below to gain access to the Vascular Cleanse video series today and immediately start reversing cardiovascular disease.